Hello, everybody, and welcome to this talk at KubeCon Cloud Native Con about Postgres extensions in Kubernetes. In this talk, I would like to introduce a novel mechanism built into an open source project to allow dynamic loading of Postgres extensions in Kubernetes. This is a very novel way that enables to run any extension that you may want to run in, again, Kubernetes. So first, about myself, who am I? Uh, you can just get to the slide, but uh, basically I am the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Ongress. Ongress means on Postgres, and that's pretty much everything that we do. I've been myself a uh, Postgres DBA developer, uh, application developer for more than 20 years, and I like to specially, specifically focus on R&D on databases, specifically Postgres. I also like to speak at Postgres and all the types of uh, uh, conferences online. Uh, actually, I have to say that the, uh, this is my first talk at KubeCon. I've tried four times before and been rejected. So I'm very happy to finally made it. Finally, uh, very happy to be here with you. So let's look at Postgres extensions. Let me do a one-on-one -on, -one on Postgres extension, extensions in case you're not familiar with them. So Postgres extensions, you can think of them as the plugins of a browser, right? They're, they're software bundles that you may install that announce the browser functionality. So Postgres extensions are pretty much the same, but applied to a Postgres database. They extend the, fun the database in so many ways, as we shall see. They are actually one of the most often cited uh, best features of Postgres. So when someone speaks about Postgres, very early on discussion say extensions are one of the very best things of Postgres because actually they transform Postgres, they significantly augment the Postgres functionality and make it a very adaptable and rich database. What is also important about extensions is that they do not follow the yearly cadence release cycle of Postgres. Um, the new features come to Postgres only once a year. So if you want to develop new features and, and you pack them as extensions, you'll be able to deliver these features to your users any moment. And so that's why they're normally developed by, by third parties. The extensions are also important for the ecosystem because they have prevented many uh, forks of Postgres because if you can run everything as uh, all your functionality as an extension, this is often the case, then you don't need to fork Postgres and it's just something that's built on top of Postgres and can run on top of any existing Postgres without having to, to fork it. And most of them are open source. So what are some examples of these extensions? PostGIS is one of the most advanced GIS systems available for databases. And this is just a set of extensions on top of Postgres. Just run a simple commands and you'll get also these extensions for you own your environment. Or look at Citus data, uh, which transforms Postgres from a, a non-distributed database into a distributed database with sharding capabilities. And all this is just by installing a single extension called Citus. Also from the same team, there's PG Auto Failover, which is an extension that adds automatic uh, failover capabilities to Postgres without requiring any external component. Again, just an extension. There's also a great example of Timescale, which is yet another extension that adds time series capabilities to Postgres, including automatic partitioning of time series data and advanced function for querying uh, time series data. Or SomebodyB, uh, extension that creates an index type that behind the scenes is an elastic search cluster. So you can do advanced full text search without leaving Postgres. So what is the extent of which you can functionality you can build on top of extensions. Well, first of all, you can add any database object. Database objects can be data types, function, this includes aggregate functions, operators, or even procedural languages. Yes, procedural languages are the languages that are used in Postgres to, to call functions or procedures, and they uh, Postgres allows you to bring your own languages. So you could bring a procedural language as an extension. They could also be what they're called in you know, other databases as storage engines, which in Postgres are table and index access methods, which allows is an API part of the Postgres API that allows you to create, uh, you can do this an extension to implement the different mechanisms for storing the data in either tables or indexes. You could, there's hooks which you can call to uh, implement uh, extension functionality, but in reality in an extension, you can call any internal Postgres function. Everything is allowed from this perspective. So you could also do replication wall that affects the durability of the database. You can create backward workers, which are processes that are managed by the database to perform different tasks. And you can even include external files to the database, like binaries or other kind of data that may also come packed as extensions. So how do you program an extension? 
Well, if the extension is just about creating objects in the database, you could use either SQL or PLPG SQL or any other procedural language uh, to create these objects. But for the most part, extensions are programmed in C and compiled into a shared library that can be loaded into the database. These are the extensions that actually allow you to call all the methods inside Postgres code. But in reality, anything that compiles to a shared library can use with extensions. So for example, you could use uh, the SOMODB extension that I just mentioned before is programmed in Rust. Uh, you could also use C++ or, you know, any new innovation is welcome. Bring your own favorite language. If it can compile to an extension, it will run or should run. So how do you use the extensions? Let's assume for a moment that they're in already installed. So if they're installed, they should have some files under typically a user share Postgres TOL, mayor version, extension, directory. There, you may find .control files, which are metadata about the extension, and uh, SQL files, which are the commands required to create the objects that uh, will represent the extension, if that's the case. Now, once the extension is installed, if it is a C extension, which is going to load a shared library into the Postgres space, then it probably needs to be loaded uh, via mechanism, which is a PostgresQL.conf configuration parameter called shared preload libraries. This is a list, a CSV, a list of extensions that you want to preload when the database starts. So you add the extension to this uh, parameter, and then you require database restart because those are loaded into memory at the start of the database. And we'll still see how it's also important later. Then you connect to any database where you want this extension, this let's say functions, data types, whatever to become available, and just run the SQL command create extension, extension name, done. That's, that's all you need to run the extension. Last but not least, some extensions provide additional uh, configuration parameters, and you can then write them for tuning the extension, uh, configure the extension on PostgreSQL.com. But how do we install the extension? Because before I said, let's assume they are in ready install. How do we install them? Well, there's no such thing as an extension store. So basically, search engines, right? In reality, some extensions can pack as their packages or RPM packages. Uh, and there's also a repository called pgxn, which also comes with a client tool that you install and helps download the extensions. The, uh, this is a fantastic tool, but the problem is that pgxn extensions, they are in source code form. So you need to compile them. pgxn automates this process, but if and only if you have already installed all the build, -up, all the build -up, uh, libraries, plus all the build libraries and dependencies of all dependencies that the extension that you're going to compile requires, which oftentimes is, is a hard task for the user. So um, it's, it's, not bad, it's great, but it's not batteries included that they are provided in source code for. So this is how extensions are in Postgres for the general part. Now let's look at extensions specifically in Kubernetes and what problems come when trying to bring all these extensions into Kubernetes. Just before doing that, let's have a look at what is the available set of extensions on cloud managed offerings. So if we look at Postgres, uh, Postgres basically includes 76 extensions. There's a small typo there in the slide, 76 extensions. Eight procedural language extensions, which are procedural languages for creating uh, functions and procedures, and 68 so-called contrib extensions. They, they all come with the Postgres source code package. So a total of 76. If we look at the main cloud offerings like uh, our Amazon RDS and Aurora, Google Cloud SQL, or Azure in if it's different uh, offerings, the number of extensions is between 50 and 70 in total. And if you look at the core extensions, this country plus this uh, procedural language, uh, most of them are available, but definitely not all of them. In some cases, even, even 32 of those core uh, contrib extensions are not available to use. You cannot install them. And uh, with regards to third party extensions, of which there are hundreds or even thousands available in the world, a very few, a very small number of them are available. Uh, the best case is Amazon Aurora, where 38 extensions are available. Now, what do you do if you want one of the extensions that are not present on these environments? Because you cannot load them. It's, uh, they, are, um, they need to be allowed on a one by one basis because this is a managed offering, right? So you're out of luck. Uh, you either need to do without extension or, or manage the database yourself. Now, Kubernetes operators allows you to enjoy an experience similar to manage uh, Postgres as a service. So maybe Kubernetes operators is the answer to this. 
because there maybe you will have more freedom. Well, the reality is that the landscape looks, looks pretty much the same. We look at we looked here at some of the uh, open source uh, Postgres operators that uh, were able to run the test to run the number of extensions available. And the Salando operator, for example, uh, brings around 90 extensions of which around 40 are third party. It's not about number, but the other operators are definitely more limited in terms of the extensions and particularly third party extensions that are offered. So what I would like to introduce today is a mechanism developed in an open source Postgres operator called StackRisk, which in version 1.0 introduces a mechanism for dynamic loading extensions which basically allows any number of extensions to be loaded. Right now, there is more than 100 extensions available, but this number is dynamic and it's growing every day, and it will cover hundreds of extensions over the future. Now, if we wanted to do this in a naive approach, let's call it that way, we could think of, OK, you know, let's pack all these hundreds of extensions into a single container. Well, that may work, but it has some problems. First of all, that may result in a gigantic container image. Even though extensions are normally not that large, some of them are like PostGIS, it's weights in around several hundred megabytes. In reality, you're gonna end up with a gigabytes database, uh, gigabytes container image. Well, that's not the end of the world, but it's certainly not ideal. But also from a security perspective, you're loading hundreds of different projects, which uh, represent a huge attack surface. And that is not ideal from a security perspective. But last but not least, when you want to introduce a new extension or a new extension version to, to fix a security problem on, on one of the available extensions as part of this container image, you need to bring a new image. And this means restart the pods, and this means restart the database, which is a quite disruptive operation for a database. So it is something you don't want to do when running a database to frequently restart the container just because you want to add a new extension or a new version of an extension that appeared as as a result of a security uh, problem with the previous version. So, so what is the mechanism that this open source project Stackers has introduced that allows dynamic loading of Postgres extensions? Let me describe it first. So first of all, no extension is built into the container image. Then we could think, okay, we could look, uh, we could load the extensions into the ephemeral storage of the container itself. The, the image is immutable, but once the container is running, there's the ephemeral storage of the container, and maybe we could load the extensions there. That would work. However, it has some problems. If, for example, the node dies or the container is restarted, this is lost. You will need to re-download the process all the time and, and reprocess the extensions all the time. That's also doable, but it's not ideal. Instead, what we do is download and install the extensions as on the PV on the persistent volume, which is typically external or distributed storage so that it will persist to survive uh, node failures or, or pod restarts. So, so once you have installed the extension once, it will probably be there all the time. Uh, it will have basically the same life cycle of your database that data, so the, the PG data directory in Postgres. We also use this functionality to relocate Postgres binaries into the persistent volume and symlink the extensions. This is also useful not only for the extension process, but also for major version upgrades. And after this, the most important and significant um, feature introduced by this functionality is what we call the cluster controller. The cluster controller is a, is a Kubernetes controller or operator, more precisely a controller, that runs as a sidecar uh, along the pod. This is because this sidecar requires access to the file system. It's going to download the extensions and pack them and install them into the PV. Um, but it is, operates as a small controller on itself. And I'll explain the, the functionality. Actually, I don't know if this is a, uh, this model of having this pod local controller or, or hierarchical controller um, that also participates in part of the reconciliation cycle is something that uh, is common to other projects and oh, this is new to this to to these projects in case as far as we know is quite unique in terms of postgres but maybe it's a pattern that could be useful for other projects and uh, uh, the extensions they are provided in compiled form and they are provided as an external repository so from the architectural perspective um, we see here that there are two operators or two controllers the main stackers operator which is the, the usual Postgres operator you can think of, which is on the top left corner of the diagram. 
And when the user instantiates a, CR, a, a CRD of a type FG, FG cluster with a spec field that basically specifies that you want to install some extension, we're also going to see how this works. Then the operator is going to perform some actions and uh, it's going to instantiate the pods and so forth. Within the pod, this local controller, the cluster controller, is going to read the information on the CR and it's going to interpret which extension needs to download. It's going to connect to this external extension repository running on the internet, download the extensions, unpack them, verify digital signatures, create symlinks, and in general, make them available to Postgres. And they will all be stored in the, in the persistent volume. Finally, there's an optional component, which is a cache proxy that will allow to cache locally extensions so that if you need to download the extensions on many, many clusters, uh, you can cache them locally. And this is also provided uh, as, part of, as, uh, as part of the open source stuff. So let's see how it really works uh, with a real code example. So this uh, is the minimal, uh, minimal uh, CR, minimal SD cluster that you may need in Stackers to create a cluster with two pods for the Postgres, latest Postgres version, 10 gigabytes this is storage for each node. And uh, this will also include connection pooling um, and uh, Envoy proxy for proxying Postgres traffic and, and a few uh, high availability, a few other bells and whistles. Okay. okay, so this is a basic uh, cluster CR that you may want to create. So let's start. Now. Let's say that the cluster is already created. Let's add an extension to it. So to do so, we just need to add these two lines that are in bold here, extensions and the name of the extension. We could also add a specific version for the extension, but this is optional. If not, Stackers will resolve it. Now, how do we know which extensions are available, their names or their versions? Well, there's three ways and you can do this. You can either go to the Stackers web console, which uh, allows you to search for extensions and um, provide descriptions and see their available versions. You can also check the documentation, or if you want to go the hard way, you can use JQ to parse the uh, repository metadata. Right? So let's go back to the extension. So when we create these and, and do a Kubectl apply and we add this extensions named PostGIS, what happens is that there's going to be a mutating webhook that is going to retrieve the extension uh, metadata from the repository. And it's going to add this to install Postgres extensions uh, section, which is basically additional metadata about the extension, including the internal build number, the Postgres Mayor version with which is compatible, the detailed uh, PostGIS version, in this case 301, the publisher, or what is the repository to keep the extension. If this extension would not be found, a warning would be issued. Then there is a validating webhook that checks that the requested extensions, because there have been expressed declaratively that you want this uh, PostGIS extension to, to be present, that is also present in the to install Postgres extensions resolve metadata. If there is no matching, if PostGIS would not be both on the top section and the section below, then the validation webhook would reject this change. So because the extension would not be available. Now, if this process goes on, then the cluster controller will come into place and the cluster controller will read this uh, CR uh, and understand that there's a willing to install the PostGIS extension. This cluster controller runs its own reconciliation cycle that is watching on these SG clusters and uh, will use a status field, the pod statuses, as you see here in the screenshot, that uh, basically allows for uh, checks for every pod whether the requested extensions have been installed. How it does so? Because this pod statuses is an array that checks for every pod, looks into the installed Postgres extensions, and you need to find the same metadata here that is uh, available in the to install uh, Postgres extensions. That's, that will list the extensions installed. Again, they need to be installed for every pod. And then updates the status, bringing back information feedback to the user about which extensions have been installed successfully. Also, following standard Kubernetes patterns, it creates a set of conditions in the, also in this part of the status field. Uh, one of those, uh, it represents the state status of the operation, whether this installation of the extensions worked or not. And second, whether the pod requires restart. Some extensions, as I mentioned, are loading dynamic libraries. And under certain conditions, they may require database uh, pod restart, database restart also. So this condition is also signaled by the pod local controller as part of the status field. So let's see a demo. Here we have 
a, a cluster running already uh, called KubeCon. Sorry, it's not very original. So it should be an HD cluster, HD plus, sorry. Yes, thank you. Called uh, KubeCon, right? There we go, which it has some pods running. Let's uh, check that we can uh, connect and check Postgres and see with, uh, what available, available extensions are there. So we'll just uh, do an exec uh, on kubecon.0 uh, container Postgres util, because we're going to run a command line. So this should get us connected to Postgres. Sorry, my bad. All right. Should get connected to Postgres. And there's a function here in Postgres called PG available extensions that will list the available, not loaded, just on the file system. Not my day. Available, sorry. The available extensions in, in, the, in the file system. And as you see, there's, there's no PostGIS. Actually, there's a very few, a small amount of extensions here. Normally, you would find dozens of extensions in a normal installation. Uh, these are just extensions that are used internally. So they are built by the, uh, they are brought by default, but they're also installed by the same mechanism. So let's look at the JAML file. It looks like this exactly like in the presentation. And let's add this extension that we want to install. So under the Postgres section, we'll call extensions. And uh, we're just going to say name PostJS. Quite simple. Let's just here to apply this. And the extension should be promptly installed. We can check this uh, by checking the, let's, for example, the, describe the uh, SG cluster kubecon. So let's do a get um, SG cluster kubecon. And we will see here that on the request section, we just said that we want PostGIS, also the mutating webhook added the version here. But then there's going to be this to install Postgres extensions section where the extensions are listed. In this case, we can see here that PostGIS has been resolved to be version 3001. That is going to the publisher is this one for the compiled for this mayor Postgres version, this build number and repository, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. As you see, the other ones are also listed here because they are downloaded using the same mechanism. Then if we look into the status, we'll see that the condition says that it didn't fail. So which means that the extensions were successfully uh, installed and that it may require a restart at some point. And look, last but not least, if look at the pod statuses that we will see that uh, on container kubecon zero, the post GIS version, yes, one installed as well as in the container kubecon one. So we have post GIS here. So yes, looks like everything worked well. So if I uh, connect again to the database and ran the same query, now I see post GIS. So it, it has been indeed dynamically loaded into the container, the PB and made available to Postgres. So actually I could just say, create extension post GIS. Oh my God, post GIS. And uh, now I have this extension available and I can, for example, list the objects that are brought by PostGIS, which are a lot of them, right? So this is how it looked like. If we actually um, look into the web console, which I also have here handy, we go to the configuration tab, we will see that uh, it is indicated here, the list of extensions that have been, been installed in the, in the cluster. You can also check uh, from, uh, uh, from the web console, which extensions are, are configured here. And if, for example, you may want to add new uh, extensions, you can just edit the cluster, go to the ext extensions section and pick any of the available extensions uh, to install. Now let's finalize this demo by um, looking into the container image of, uh, to see how this looks like. So let's con uh, connect to the controller, cluster controller which is the sidecar uh, controller that is running. And I'll run a shell here to see where these extensions have been downloaded. So the PB is mounted on Barley Postgres. So if we go to Barley Postgres and look here, we see that this is the data, data for the database. 
we see the binaries for Postgres which have been relocated and the extensions. So let's let's look into the extensions directory and they are uh, yeah, split by Postgres minor version and then build number. And here we have the downloaded extensions. So here we see the post GIS that we requested with the tar package, which contains all the code about the extension, digital signature and a file indicated whether it has been installed or not. Then these extensions are unpacked into this uh, directory um, under the USR folder. So if you get under USR, we can look at the share Postgres 13 major version extensions. And here, we see PostGIS with all these control and SQL uh, files that are created when you install the extension, which happen to be symbolic links to the real directory where the Postgres binaries are being run and are accessible to Postgres. So even though it looks a bit complicated, the good thing and the good news is that all this process is absolutely transparent to you. So uh, in summary, what are these uh, extensions uh, mechanism, dynamic loading mechanism for extensions built uh, by the Stackers open source project. So it is a mechanism that obviously, as I mentioned before, allows loading dynamically extensions, removing loading and loading upgrading extensions. They're not built into the container image. And this is very good because the container image becomes extension less. It has two main advantages. One is increased security because the uh, surface expo exposed surface attack surface is much less. There's no dynamic, uh, this dynamic libraries and potential source code of other extensions being built into the container, but it also decreases the container size. Also, this enables a declarative approach to loading and unloading Postgres extensions because they are built into the SG cluster CRD via JAML or via the web console, which piggybacks on the same system internally, you're able to express which your intent with these which extensions you want to have. And actually on a future version, we'll allow a mechanism to restrict by an administrator which extensions may be uh, used on the SG clusters CRD. So you could uh, limit if you want to, which extensions can be or cannot be downloaded and installed obviously. And the main novelty that uh, has been introduced is definitely in the Postgres world, not sure if a similar approach has been done with other operators that are not related to Postgres, is the use of uh, what we call the cluster controller or a pod local controller, which is a small controller running as a sidecar that has access to the file system in the pod so that it can uh, watch on some fields on the CR, the ST cluster CR, watching for extensions that need, the user wants them to be installed, then downloading them from the external extension repository and bringing them to the local file system, downloading and packing, verifying the digital signatures and installing and make, making them available to Postgres. This is a pattern that we believe is quite useful, uh, potentially also for other projects. We're also looking for feedback. So if you have any idea or um, willingness to share some, some thoughts on this, feel free to do so. And at the end, what this allows you is to run Postgres on Kubernetes with an, with an practically unlimited number of extensions without having to download new images. So it allows you to run as of today more than 100 extensions and with a growing number in the future. So uh, if you faced any restriction by running on a cloud managed environment, now you can get the same experience by running a Stackgres and Postgres operators in Kubernetes with any extensions that you may need. So that's it. I'm gonna open for questions. Thank you for listening so far. If after this talk, you still have some questions wanna, wanna reach, uh, yes, please uh, join uh, the, the Slack and or Discord uh, Stackers uh, community uh, services. So you can join us and continue the talk there. So open for questions and thank you very much for listening.